Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our midweek. Uh, happy Wednesday. Good to see all of you as always. And uh, tonight, uh, we are, can you, I don't know if you can even believe it, we are 13 days away from our presidential election, which will happen on November the 3rd. Uh, tonight is the last of our guest speakers. Uh, and um, of course, next week, I think you all know that we're going to have an evening devoted to prayer. So I want to encourage you guys to make sure that you come back next week prepared to pray. Uh, we're going to have an awesome evening together where we pray and just really get our hearts and minds uh, ready and prepared for uh, not just the election, of course, right? Not just the presidential election, but we are praying uh, for our heavenly calling and election as well. So uh, I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Uh, my friend, my brother, Will Archer. Uh, Will is a visionary, uh, passionate evangelist. He leads the church in uh, Potomac Valley, uh, which is Woodbridge, uh, in Woodbridge, Virginia. Uh, let me tell you something. Will is very, very busy. It is 10 o'clock uh, in Virginia where Will is at. And so I can't even begin to tell you how grateful I am that Will decided uh, to say yes and, and to join us for uh, our call tonight. But uh, in addition to leading a church, Will is currently a doctoral candidate uh, at the Virginia Theological Seminary. Uh, he's also active in various community efforts there in Virginia as well. Uh, Will has been married uh, to his wife, Tasha, who, by the way, is a uh, very powerful and effective communicator herself. But they've been married for 21 years. They have two children, 17 and 12. Uh, brothers and sisters, again, um, please, please welcome our brother, Will Archer. And Daryl is actually going to lead us in a prayer, and then Will is going to take over. So let's give Will a big welcome. Uh, let's pray. Father God, uh, thank you so much uh, for an opportunity to be with you today, God. Uh, thank you so much for Will uh, coming to uh, preach the word to us, God. I pray that you lift him up, lift up his heart, God and open our hearts to what he has to say from the scriptures, God. This is an opportunity for us to learn about our relationship with you, God, and how we want to make our election to heaven sure. Thank you so much for our family, for the blessings you've given us, God. We're so encouraged to be here together tonight, God. Bless our service and bless this time. We love you. We pray all this in your son's name. Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Well, I am incredibly grateful and honestly very humbled to have this conversation um, with all of you. Uh, it was just so uh, delightful to be able to catch up with a small group of you beforehand and, and then just to hear just the, the buzz of the fellowship and everybody connecting. Uh, there is really nothing like being among uh, believers, being uh, in our family and, um, and, and you know, having people mess with each other and, and just enjoy just the fellowship of being together. Uh, I know this has been a very difficult chapter um, for our country, and uh, definitely in, in many of the churches and our families of churches, particularly here in North America, uh, this has been a very challenging year. It's been a brutal year. Um, but also, it's been a year, I think, that's helped to refine our faith and clarify our convictions, and really, I think, will propel us to do even greater things as we really seek to, to do God's will. Uh, I'm very grateful for the Perkins and, and just their, their kindness in inviting me in, inviting us in as a family. And, and I pray that the things that I have the opportunity to share with you, that they are both, as was prayed, you know, really led by the Holy Spirit and, uh, and also beneficial for your faith. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to be very candid about my own uh, thoughts around things um, and my own observations uh, from being a Christian for uh, 27 years. And, um, and uh, please know that I welcome you having radically divergent views than mine. Um, I, I welcome you um, challenging anything that I share. And, and at the end, we're going to provide some time for questions. If there are any things that, that um, uh, would, uh, you'd benefit from clarification, or uh, if you'd like to email me, you can, well, I welcome you emailing me if you have any questions or, or thoughts around what I share. Um, 
And the best way to reach me, by the way, is greater every day at gmail.com. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm honestly very, very humbled. I'm very humbled that I would have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, as Dana said, we're 13 days away from an election um, that in many ways um, will be one for the history books that will remind us of many things as we reflect back on it. It's an election in our country that uh, is met with a lot of enthusiasm, um, a tremendous amount of um, consternation, and uh, literally billions of dollars uh, have been invested and are being invested right now in trying to shape the, the, the thoughts, the minds, and the, and the choices that people make. And I think that's an important context to know as we're going into it because uh, you know, the calling that we've received from God in order to make our calling and our election sure is a calling that we would have uh, deep and abiding convictions that are immovable about who God is, but are also responsive to the world that we live in and live around. Um, but I, I've got to tell you, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I'm saying this a number of times, it's incredibly humbling for you to ask me what I would think about this. Um, because, you know, as many individuals as there are in the world and in our fellowship, there are that many opinions. So I'm, I'm very honored that I get to, to share my thoughts with you. I, I'm going to share my screen here. I have a couple slides that I hope are, um, are helpful for our conversation. Um, so let me just get to that. And let me share what I got. So I haven't been there. But I've been looking at pictures, and when I think about you, I think about like really clean water and really big mountains. But I'm sure it's a lot more dynamic than that, because you know, at South Sound Church of Christ. This is what I thought of, um, and uh, when I thought about you, I was like, man, they just you know they're crystal clear, immovable in their faith, and uh, seeking to really reflect God and His 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 heart for the world. Amen. Uh, this is my family. Uh, Dana already shared about my family a bit, but I'll just tell you, this lady right here, Tasha, is incredible. Um, she's been married to me for 21 years, and that takes a lot of effort and energy and Christianity. She is the most genuine person I know, and uh, so I'm very grateful for being able to walk with her, and then that's my son, Makai, and my daughter, Journey, and we are a crazy upside-down family. This picture probably best represents who we are. We're, we're crazy people that are all over the place, so this, this is our family. Uh, so as you're going into this election series, you've, been, you've had the benefit of lots of conversations, I'm sure lots of prayer and thought, and also listening to other speakers as we go into this election series. And my hope is that our conversation will help to orient you as you move forward. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about kind of my story and also our context here uh, in Potomac Valley. So let me tell you a little bit about our context. I live 20 miles um, from uh, the White House. Um, our Congregation is uh, racially diverse, politically diverse, and that is a beautiful thing, um, except when you're not doing well spiritually. And uh, so I just, just, I just to be real with you, um, we got started as a region that became an independent cooperative congregation in 2007. About a year into being a church, we almost split in 2008. When President Obama was elected in 2008, uh, there were cliques, factions, attitudes, horrible things said to Christians about each other and with each other. It was not a good thing. Uh, we weren't here at the time, but we heard a lot about the fallout of that um, as we came in to lead the congregation. Uh, that created some deep resentment, some deep hurt feelings um, that had a lasting impact on us uh, for uh, probably um, uh, easily the next seven years. Um, uh, that would follow. Why I say seven years is because Tasha and I had the opportunity to come about six years later um, in 2014. And, uh, and when we came, the church was very clear. We have racial issues. Uh, we have political issues. There was nobody was pretending like it wasn't a thing. Um, it was definitely a thing. And, um, and our congregation, our, our growth as a congregation really seized up. Uh, we would grow and people would move and people would leave. Um, and we started with about 132 uh, disciples in seven years between 2007 and, and um, 
in about 2014, um, we, we grew uh, to 135 disciples. And growth isn't everything, but in a seven-year period, that kind of you know, limited growth tells you a lot. Uh, there were some people that were passionately making disciples, incredible leaders that poured themselves out, great ministry couples, um, you know, great, a lot of money was invested in building the church, but, but the internal stuff in our relationships had us stuck, is the truth. And so what we had to do was we had to make some decisions about where we're going to go. Um, issues around politics and race are a constant um, thing that we have to contend with. I would argue that it's a great blessing, but it can also be an incredible challenge if we're not, if we don't have a spiritual perspective. So just so you know, Potomac Valley, messed up group of people, incredible people, very talented, um, but also um, if we're not going in the wrong direction, we can both clear a lot of ground and we can try to kill each other at the same time. So I just wanna let you know who we are so you don't think we got anything together. We're just regular people. And we talk about this just so you know, you can tell the people in Potomac Valley I said that because we are real about who we are. We are messed up people trying to make it. And, um, and so, but 2008 really was a low watermark and really gave us um, a clear indication of where we'd be if we didn't really tackle these issues. Um, now, repentance changed everything for us. You know, when we got here, we took the first four months just getting to know the church. And, um, and then the next eight months, we did deep teaching. And then at, after being here for a year, we fasted for a day in September. This is 2015, a day in September, three days in October, seven days in November. And then we started 2016 um, with a 21 day fast. And, um, and that really was transformative for us. Um, uh, that time of fasting began with a call, uh, some teaching on repentance by Ed Anton and ended with a call to repentance from Phil Booker. And then we made a decision that we would publicly confess our congregational or corporate sin. Um, and just myself and Tasha, Tasha and I started, not our personal sin, just, you know, I've allowed the church to have a culture of cliques. I have not addressed gossip. I have not taken responsibility for us being united on, you know, even though we may have different views. So we took corporate responsibility. For context, it took us four hours for our leaders to confess our sin. There were a lot of tears, a lot of confession, but that decision in repentance brought about this beautiful time of refreshing. And honestly, the past four years have been the most amazing four years in our history. Um, this year is our 13th year. We're a teenage church. It's our 13th year as a church, uh, but that came out of a commitment to repentance. And I'm going to share what that looks like in a practical level or what that's looked like in a practical level over the past four years. Why that's contextually important to this conversation is because there are no solutions without repentance. There just aren't. Um, and there are no solutions without God and without his word really directing and defining us. Anybody that tells you they've got it figured without God is not speaking from God. And so only God can change what we're dealing with. And I pray that you are convinced. I am absolutely convinced. Uh, 222,000 Americans dying of the coronavirus has convinced me that I am only here because of the grace of God. Uh, that represents five times the number of Christians we have in our North American churches. If you imagine that every Christian that you knew or know in our, in our family of churches now, there are other Christians outside of our family of churches, but I'm speaking specifically within our family of churches. If every Christian you knew passed away, that five times that has died from the coronavirus. We are not here by accident. We're not here because we're better people. We're here because God's calling us uh, to be his people and to be his voice um, to the communities where we live. And, um, and the election will not solve the contention that's going on in the hearts of people. Only the message of the gospel will solve that. Um, and I think that's an important um, conviction I know that I've gotten as I've sought to navigate the realities of where we are. So how do you navigate racial injustice?
big issue that's being uh, addressed within uh, our world right now. How do you make sense of questions like racial injustice? How do you make sense of the world that we're in and the brokenness in the world that we're in? The, the solution is Jesus. How do you make sense of how to think about the election? The solution is Jesus. Now, we can say that, and sometimes that's a pad answer for um, we're not going to involve ourselves in the world. We're not going to get caught up in civilian affairs, quote unquote. Um, and we're just going to focus on making disciples. Um, I do think it's important to make disciples, but it's also important to ensure that we are the Christians that God's called us to be in the context that we find ourselves in. So to that, I invite you to look at Acts chapter six. You guys still with me? Okay. All right, Acts chapter six, um, this scripture, and we're gonna look at a few scriptures, but this scripture has really helped me to make sense of how I need to think about the election, how I need to think about my role in, in this world as it is. Now, Acts six is really powerful because, you know, Acts chapter two, everything's awesome. I mean, Jesus died, buried, raised from the dead, you know, Acts 1, he's with them for 40 days, gives them instruction, you know, and then on the day of Pentecost, Peter steps up, preaches the gospel, 3,000 people get baptized, I mean, the gospel's being spread, the, the, the disciples face persecution, but they overcome it, there's the powerful prayer for boldness, like, things are, I mean, there's, you know, there are no needy people that you see in Acts 4, I mean, it's just going great, right? And then Acts 6 happens. In Acts 6, it says, in those days, the number of disciples was increasing, and the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of uh, the spirit and of wisdom, and we'll turn this responsibility over to them, and we'll give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. The proposal pleased the whole group, and then they chose the seven, right? Now think about this for a second. Everything's great, and they have a diverse community. Um, now, in, in our family of churches, we have the benefit of having a diverse community. And I'm gonna just stop the sharing, share here for a second. We're gonna come right back to this. Um, but we have the benefit of a diverse community. Um, you know, 41 years ago, officially, when, when the International Churches of Christ, um, you know, started coming together, um, one of the commitments that we made is that we would be a diverse church. Now, I've been a Christian for 27 of those 41 years. I've served in seven North American churches. And in every one of the North American churches that I've served in, including one in the Caribbean, I have witnessed, experienced, or had to confront and contend with uh, racism, prejudice, um, injustice, um, and, uh, and, you know, and preferential treatment. And I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in our church, because our church is filled with sinners, and sinners sin, and sinners bring in unhealthy thoughts and unhealthy cultural practices into the equation. Uh, Acts chapter six is a helpful tool to us because the amazing Christians that we model ourselves after in Acts chapter two are the same people we're meeting in Acts chapter six. As the numbers of Christians grew and the group became even more diverse, they had to contend with cultural challenges. One of them was prejudice. This is important because um, there was a division that was happening and had happened in the early church. And this division hurt the most vulnerable group in the, in the congregation, the widows. They were being overlooked in getting just enough food to eat. Think about the hurt feelings and the sadness and the anger and the disappointment that these widows and their families felt. And the disillusionment that the same Christians from Acts 4, where there were no needy people felt, that as the group grew, there were real stress points that they were going through. The apostles' response was brilliant. They didn't try to figure it out themselves. They had the humility to ask others to be a part of the solution. They um, identified and appointed our first set of deacons 
to tackle the situation. And Acts chapter six and verse seven is a big part of what I'd like us to talk about tonight. In Acts six, seven, they address the issue and it says, so the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and many priests became obedient to the faith. So here's my deep conviction. I believe that we are on the precipice as we go into this election, 13 days out, of an Act 6-7 moment. We have the benefit of being in a fellowship that is dysfunctional, does have inequity, but is diverse, and does have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Those who have believed, repented, and been baptized have received the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. We have what they had. We've been entrusted what they were entrusted with. And so the darkness in the world doesn't scare me. It shouldn't scare you. You know, in, in, in Psalm 23, 4, it says, though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid because your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. God is calling us to correct our viewpoint and to have the right direction about where we're going. We have to address real issues real issues in our own hearts, real issues in our congregations. Um, I know you guys are an amazing group of Christians, but I know you're sinners just like us. I would probably argue that we're worse than you, uh, but you might argue that you're worse than me, you know? But I, you know, I got a pretty strong argument. We, you know, we some jacked up people. But, but here's the thing, it was never about us. This is about God's glory. This is for God's name and for God's honor. And for the sake of God's honor and God's name in our world and in our country right now, it's really important that we have deep biblical, truly biblical conviction about what it means to engage in the world as it is. So that, that's, that, is, uh, that is a deep and abiding conviction. And we're going to come back to this. I'm going to continue on here by talk, talking about what that looks like in practical terms and offer hopefully some, some, some real um, uh, solutions as to where we might go with that. So first off, I think it's important for us to recognize that we have to develop spiritual elasticity for the new wine that God is giving us, that we need to become new wineskins um, and to really apply on changing principles for uncharted territory. Nobody knows what's gonna happen after the election. Nobody knows what's gonna happen as the number of coronavirus cases seems to be climbing, uh, we're going into the flu season. And I was just talking with a, a, a health official, a state health official, um, and, um, and there's also you know, an unknown virus um, that, that, that some medical professionals are also catching on to. So we have two things we know. We know about the flu and we have vaccines for that. We know about corona, we don't have a vaccine for that. And there's also something else that seems to be in the mix, and it may be just a bad flu strain, but we don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of unknowns. So how do you navigate all these unknowns on top of it being an election year, on top of the fact that we're dealing with the, the reality of a new civil rights movement uh, that's emerging in our country uh, right now? Uh, you have to have, I have to have spiritual elasticity. So let's turn on over to Luke chapter five. And Luke 5 here, uh, our brother, Dr. Luke, helps us out by documenting something that Jesus says. And in Luke 5, specifically in 38 and 39, but for context, I'll start in verse 36. It says, he told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he, does, if he does, he will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and the skins will run out, and, or rather the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking new wine wants the old, or rather no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. So Jesus is telling a parable. We're familiar with the parable. The parable though is that, that you need to be a new wineskin you need new wineskins to pour new wine. If you pour new wine into an old wineskin, it's going to burst. Now, I don't know about you, but I reached capacity emotionally 
about March. That's about where I hit capacity. Um, that's, that's me. And I'll tell you why. You know, um, my mom passed away in January. And um, she passed away. I got the opportunity to go and preach to one of our sister congregations. And while I was preaching that Tuesday to a staff, my mom passed away. And it was devastating for my, um, for my siblings and devastating for me as well. And, um, and, um, and then after my mom died, uh, my father, who had passed away 30 plus years ago, um, uh, we had um, a neighbor that cheated us out of um, uh, an inheritance that we had, and it was listed in the newspaper. It, it, my dad's Jamaican. The, the, what, what the neighbor did was listed in the newspaper about two weeks, or at least I found out about it about two weeks after my mom died. So all the pain of a betrayal from a neighbor, um, you know, the theft of property, the loss of my father, the loss of my mother, I, I was just, I was in a bad place. Um, and then the coronavirus, um, uh, you know, really became more well known and we went into shutdown and the work of the ministry radically changed. And, uh, and I, I'll be honest, I struggled in my faith um, and I had to get some great help from close friends, um, you know, great discipling. I, I also got advice that I needed to get grief counseling and I went through several months of grief counseling and um, and, and, you know, as I was beginning to see the light with the grief counseling, um, then, you know, the story about Ahmad Avery uh, came out and became more popularized. And I'm a runner. And my son's a runner. And I, I'll be honest with you, that, that had a profound impact on me um, as a runner, uh, as, as a black man in America, as a disciple of Jesus concerned about specifically, you know, helping men to know God, working with young men and seeking to help them. Um, you know, I, those things impacted me in a very real and profound way. And I had to go to scriptures like this, and I encourage you to look at scriptures like this and recognize that it's God's intent that we not um, try to deal with new realities as old wineskins. We have to really ensure that we confront things as they are, but that we really go to God for God to renew us. Here's what I mean by that in practical terms. Uh, turn on over, if you will, uh, to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. You guys still with me here? Yeah? Okay. I know we're on Zoom. You're like, but I'm muted. I can't really tell oh, you. Well. So, um, but, um, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says right here, and Paul is explaining this principle, and he explains that we're not like Moses. Um, instead, in, in verse 12, it says, therefore, since we have such a hope, this, this hope of the transformation of the Holy Spirit, since we have such a hope, we're very bold. See, we're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while his radiance was fading away, but their minds were made dull. But to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who's the spirit. So here's the thing. It really doesn't matter how difficult the circumstances are. What matters is whether we are being transformed by God. We don't have to hide our faces because it's God who transforms us. You know, Moses didn't want people to lose confidence when they saw that his, his, his shine was diminishing because he, had, he wasn't in the presence of God. He didn't want them to lose confidence. In contrast, as believers, we actually display our weaknesses and we take off the veil because God himself is transforming us through the active work of the Holy Spirit so that we can be those new wineskins. God wants to do something in our day like we've never seen before. The light shines the brightest in the darkness. And the history of Christianity is filled with the story that whenever things got the toughest, the church always rose to the occasion. So that's why I think we're at an Acts 6-7 moment. 
when things seem their hardest, if we engage in the world as it is, if we address the issue squarely, then we have an opportunity to show the world what no one's ever seen, a broken community of flawed people who deal with the real issues and can point the way forward. But that is the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, I like what Churchill says here, the mistake of years cannot be remedied in hours. These are not quick, there are no quick fixes to this. The realities of our world, they're not gonna be fixed by a midweek charge. This is a conversation that's in, that, that I hope will, will stimulate you to positive thinking and encourage you to rely on God more. You know, th there's nothing that Dana's gonna do. I mean, Dana's got cool locks. When I grow up, I wanna have locks like him. You know, I really do. My son can grow locks. I got, you know, the hair I got, it works with gel, but it, don't, it doesn't lock as well as, as, as my son tells me. I can't, I don't have that. But you know, it doesn't matter how long your hair is. It doesn't matter how short your hair is. It doesn't matter if you just have hair follicles. God knows every hair in your head. And you cannot fix problems based on your capacity or your goodness or your strength. The real problems of our world can only be fixed by God. And I pray that we can recognize that we actually do have the solution, not because we're gonna come in and charge in and save the day, but because broken people who put their trust in God can show a broken world that God is the one they need to trust in. So in Proverbs 21, one, it says this, it says, good leadership is like a channel of water controlled by God. He directs it to whatever end he chooses. My question for you tonight is, are you willing to be whatever God wants you to be? You know, when I was growing up, I, I wanted to be like Bruce Lee. You know, I, I, when I was in high school, I did, I had Bruce Lee shoes. I did, I could do a lot of push-ups back then. I can do, I can do a couple now, not, not what I could do when I was a kid, but I want to be like Bruce Lee. And one of the things Bruce Lee said is you got to be like water. You've got to be adaptable. You, you've got to be flexible. You know, the Christian is called to have spiritual elasticity. As Christians, we're called to be directed by God to whatever end he chooses. Let's talk about that. I would say there are three things that will help you to do that. The first is I would, I, I would encourage us as we go into this election and beyond that we need to get embedded in our local community. You need to get embedded in your neighborhood, embedded in your community, embedded in the county or the city that you live in. Uh, we need to be engaged in the world, but we don't need to be entangled in the things of the world. Um, my honest assessment is we really have a hard time with being embedded. Uh, we generally come into communities. We seek to bring people into our space um, and, um, and we circle our wagons and we don't generally get embedded in local communities. Um, you know, I'm very, very grateful for the tremendous work that Hope Worldwide does. You know, Dana's on the Hope Board, um, incredible work. But a lot of us have outsourced our service to the poor to Hope Worldwide. And we really only serve our community when, you know, Dana or others tell us that we should and give us um, practical ways to do it. But I, I, I think as Christians, we got to get in the weeds with people uh, and get in the weeds in our community. Um, in, in a very relational way, and not for what we can get from our community, but for what we can give and how we can, uh, how we can make things better, really making things on earth as they are in heaven. Uh, so embedded, engaged, but not entangled. This is my, my daughter back when we were in the Bahamas, and uh, this is my absolute favorite picture in the world. She has wide open arms. She was a little girl then, and I pray she can learn to live this way. Uh, this a posture, open posture, is a posture that we've learned that we have to take to engage these issues directly. Um, what I mean by that is that we extend ourselves to those on the left as much as we extend ourselves to those on the right. A and I am speaking about politically left and right, ideologically left and right, people wherever they are. We, we are a church for all people. Um, but not everyone feels welcome in our church. Um, and so we've had to change some things in our church in particular to really, to really do that. Um, you know, we 
have had uh, Democratic and Republican congressmen come to church and speak to the church about being good neighbors. Uh, we've had local government officials that are Democrats and Republicans that have come to church. Um, in uh, the family group I was just in, we just made a couple family group changes. The family group I was just in, uh, we have elected uh, Democratic officials and elected uh, Republican officials that are active parts of our family groups and an active part of our uh, our community. Um, and um, and you know and and so we 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 really make it our our business to um, invite all people and to be a place for all people. The 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 way that you do that, this cruciformed or open posture, is you really have to be impartial towards either side. Now I have my own personal views about political issues, um, but my conviction as a Christian is that I totally support people having any political view that they want to have on the left or the right, not any political view, but either political position, really not any political view, just for the record, because that's been, we're being recorded. I don't agree with any political view, but I welcome people from wherever they are. Jesus did this, by the way. Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector do not agree with each other. They just don't. But Jesus put them in a team together. He, he built the church on this premise because Jesus wants all people to be saved. And so we, we have to be like Jesus. This is a very vulnerable. You have to be either led by God or crazy to take this approach. This is not a defensive posture. This is actually an offensive posture. You can only go into the world like this if your daddy's really big and he's behind you. But you don't go into the world like this unless you're crazy, because you'll get attacked for that. Um, how do you go about doing that? I believe that a part of that is reorienting the way we think about Christianity. And there's not enough time to talk about this, but I'll just touch on it real quickly. Uh, Matthew 22 and Matthew 25 actually come before Matthew 28. Just numerically. The problem is we start the conversation often with Matthew 28. We're all about making disciples. And a lot of times we, we don't focus enough as Christians on loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbors yourself. On loving uh, the stranger, the naked, uh, you know, the, the thirsty, the hungry, you know, loving people in their situation and loving them without what they can give us, i.e. become a part of our church, just loving them for them. Just loving God and loving people reorients our relationship with our community and reorients our relationship with the world. And just so you know, the harvest for sincere Christians, the harvest in the world that I believe God is calling sincere disciples of Jesus to be able to bring in is bigger than anyone could imagine. I think the most amazing time for the church is right now. So we have 13 days to pray, fast, prepare, you know, galvanize our convictions. Because after the election, people are going to figure out that the ele election doesn't solve things. It, it will change who occupies the White House, but it doesn't solve the brokenness in our community. Our community was broken long before 12 years ago, long before 100 years ago. You can't go far enough back to solve our problems. The only way forward is to follow God and to follow his way. And, um, and that, that is a radically transformative um, idea, but it was Jesus' idea. And so I'm, I, I'm, I like our odds. So practically speaking, how do we go about doing this? Again, I wanna be sensitive for time because we're, we're, we're coming up on a little bit of time here. It's important to learn your context, the men of Issachar, knew what time it was and what Israel should do. You and I, we need to know what time it is. It, it is time for us to be deep in our word, closer to each other and, um, and more resolute about being God's church and being God's people as we go into what is gonna be pretty amazing. Practicals. Uh, these are the elected officials in my community. I live in Prince William County. It is um, the first majority minority county in the state of Virginia. It's the second largest jurisdiction 
these are our supervisors, basically our mayor and our city council. Um, of these people that are here, uh, one of them is an active part of our community now, um, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, uh, six of them have come to church. Another has committed to come to church this year. And there's one other uh, who hasn't committed yet to come to church. Um, all these people are my, they're my community. And so I think it's important to learn your community. Um, it's important to engage. Uh, I definitely think we need to share our faith with all people. And I may have frozen there. Did I freeze? No? Okay, I'm back. Okay, it's set on stable. Uh, I think it's important to, to know your community and to engage with them. It's also important to, um, to show compassion to all people. This is a picture of something we did call the Great Banquet, where we, um, we barbecued uh, a thousand pounds of meat and, um, and had a massive barbecue, brought the whole community out and we just serve the community um, as Jesus calls us to serve. Um, it, this is not a story where I tell you, we barbecued a thousand pounds of meat and then we had a hundred baptisms. I have no idea how many people will become Christians through what we did. We just did it because it was the right thing to do. Um, and we didn't do it for the result other than we wanted to testify to the community that we cared. It has resulted in more people know people that truly love our community. Here's one of the things that I think this event that happened three years ago and then two years ago and didn't happen this year because of Corona did. Um, around the middle of June, tensions were really high. Second largest ju uh, jurisdiction, first majority minority county in, in Virginia, tensions were really high. The, the, um, the chair of the board of supervisors basically the mayor in our community 500,000 people called up and said we need this and um and 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 really building community again and we want to ask your church to moderate it because we know that you guys are honest brokers you will not be partial to republicans or democrats uh, i was blown away that we were asked to moderate that conversation. And since then, we've moderated other conversations with the chief of police, with many other faith leaders, with the Muslim, Christian, and Jewish community. Um, we are engaged in a very practical way in showing people who Jesus is. I, I don't know what God will do with that, but I can tell you um, we're doing this for God's glory and for his name being lifted up. I offer these things not to say that a, an event is what changes things, but rather to say that being a Christian right now could not be more important. Being truly Christian in an unchristian, non-Christian world is really important. So you, as you go into the election, don't get caught in the trap of right or left. Recognize that you are here for all people with your hands extended to all people, and people really need God. Uh, this is a group of community leaders. Again, for time, I won't go too far into it. Um, but these are our, our group of friends where I, I got a chance to spend 11 months with these guys. Once a month, we got together and we really studied our community. I sat down with our county demographer. I can tell you where the pockets of poverty are. I can tell you who the key players are in, in the human service community. And, um, and our team as a staff, we know our community and our community now knows that we are Christians in a way that they didn't know before. Um, the last thing I'll share is just a bit of good news uh, kind of coming out of this. As a result of this engagement, God opened up a door for us. Um, you know, I, I chair um, an organ, a human service organization that was granted $2 million of CARES funds money to help people pay their mortgage and um, pay their pay their rent and um, help people with childcare expenses and medical expenses uh, affected by COVID. And we're able to distribute that $2 million to 26 organizations. But one of them is our congregation, Potomac Valley. And we're actually right now in an active process of helping people. We've, we've been given $150,000 to help people. I cannot tell you the tears, the stories of people that didn't know if they could even keep the lights on if they had enough food or enough, um, uh, you know, enough just to, to get caught up. 
uh, the single mothers who've lost jobs. Uh, the stories are unbelievable, to be honest. And um, for us to do that, we're only able to do that because we got embedded. So I'm not talking about this like conceptually, I'm talking about this practically. And I, I, I'm not saying that this is the solution of all solutions, but I just wanna let you know, as you're listening to this message today, just know that our country's hurting. And when people lose a family member, if you don't show up at the funeral, they'll remember that. You can ask Dana, he's a preacher. You can ask all the preachers that are on the line here and all the elders. People remember if you show up when things are bad. So as Christians, we gotta recognize things are bad in a lot of places. And they're not just bad based on race, they're bad based on so many ways, really based on sin. And so as Christians, you wanna show up. But if you show up, God will open up some doors for you to be able to help even more people than you can imagine. I believe God's calling us to an incredible moment. I won't share about this just for time. Let me just share this last thought and then we'll open up for some questions. A, a ship is safe in harbor, but that is not what ships were built for. You and I, we were not built for the easy work of simply avoiding the conflicts of our day. We were built for the hard work of binding up the wounds of God's people, God's lost sheep, finding the lost sheep, seeking people out, being there uh, for people at the most critical time and being representatives, ambassadors of Christ, ministers of reconciliation, that will take you into uncharted waters. And this election definitely is that. But I will tell you in all sincerity, I have zero fear of the results of the election one way or the other. I have great confidence that our great God has positioned us at this time in our country's history, this time in our fellowship's history, and this time in the history of Christianity to truly go into these uncharted waters. They're choppy, they're tumultuous, but we don't have to fear because God is the one who goes with us. Will you follow Jesus into uncharted waters? Make your calling an election sure. You've ca you're called by God to be a disciple of Jesus. And if you haven't yet made that choice to be a disciple of Jesus, let me tell you, there's lots of people on this, this call here that can study the Bible with you and can help you not only to have your sins forgiven, but to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so you can be completely transformed in your life. You, you'll have lots of stuff like we all do on this call to work through, lots of character flaws, and, and we, we're a community that has that. But we are a community that's called. Make your calling and your election sure. And as you go into the election, I pray that you can go in with a boldness and a clarity and a resolve that you're going to love all people. Um, you don't have to agree with all people. I definitely do not agree with all people. I don't want you to think that I do, because um, I don't. And uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I have lots of opinions um, about things, but they're just that. Um, my conviction is that Jesus is the solution, and I'm grateful that we share that conviction. And I think that conviction is what binds us and what will transform us. Let's be new wineskins and take these unchanging principles into these very, very uncharted territory. And now I want to open it up for some questions. If you have some, um, and I can share a little bit about what we're, we're learning, uh, or you can tell me, man, I just do not agree with that stuff at all. Thanks for coming. I'm glad you're on the other side of the country. So, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know uh, but, uh, but I, I hope that's helpful to you. Absolutely. Will, thank you very much, brother. This was the perfect ending to an awesome series. Yes. Uh, bro, thank you, thank you, thank you again. Uh, this has been awesome. And I think we're going to do something, be, being that Will is our last speaker of the evening, we're kind of, I'm going to call an audible here. Instead of going into our, our groups right now, maybe we'll do that in a minute here, but what I'd like to do is if you have any questions for Will, uh, based on anything that you heard, questions or comments that you'd like to add. If you could go to your participants uh, button down at the bottom, go to participants, raise your hand. And uh, if we see your hand raised, <clears throat> excuse me, if we see your hand raised, then we'll call on you and, and open your, your, uh, your mic so that you can share. Again, I'd ask that you don't just kind of burst out and start sharing if you want to <laughs> share. 
Uh, we want to do it orderly. Please raise your hand uh, in the comments section. As we see your hands go up, uh, we'll open your mic up and you can share there. Uh, but, and as I'm waiting on people to raise their hands, well, let me just say again, bro, this was fantastic. And uh, we have, uh, I think you are the seventh speaker that we've had through our, our time together. Uh, again, every time we have a speaker, I feel like I'm pretty smart. Uh, you know, I set this up pretty well and I know I'm not that smart, but I, I think the smartest thing that we could have done was save this for last. This was exactly what we needed to hear tonight as we head into this election. I, I think the, the challenges, uh, the things that you shared were so appropriate for this time. And uh, I'm taking a lot away from this myself. Uh, definitely, you're, I want to talk to you offline. We, we had set up a time that we were going to talk. I want to talk about your community engagement and get some, you know, just some practical how-tos from you. But I appreciate what you're doing and just the conviction that has taken you into your community, the way that God is working with and through you and through the members of the Potomac Valley Church. Bro, it's so inspiring and very encouraging, and uh, we're so grateful. So I see a couple of hands going up. Uh, let me call on Casey, uh, Casey Staley. Go ahead, Casey. Yes. Thanks, Will, again. Thanks again so much for being here. Um, yeah, so I, you don't probably know because we were behind the screens, um, but you uh, preached at a class for the International Singles Conference and you talked about pain with a purpose. And so I just feel like that really stuck out to me in this, that like a lot of the things that we're going through is painful, but there's a purpose. Like and we, if we focus on the purpose, like we'll have the goal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is God. So I just thought about that, you being here. Um, but I also wanted to know a little bit more about the community engagement too. And what that, I mean, looks like, at was it something initially that you guys, um, yeah, like just some ideas about that. I, I would love to hear. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for us, a couple of things. One is, you know, I, I, I'm really convicted by what the scriptures teach. One example is Matthew 25. I, I, I think, you know, Christian is as Christian does. And I, I think a lot of times we get hung up on our, the fact that we teach sound doctrine, orthodoxy, not recognize that you have to marry orthodoxy with orthopraxy, that you, with a sound practice. You need life and doctrine, both wings of the airplane. You need both of those things. And so uh, when I looked at Matthew 25, I asked myself, you know, what, what am I going to tell Jesus when, when I meet him? You know, will I be a sheep or a goat? Um, so that was one thing that's informed our engagement. The other is um, because of the division, Satan sought to divide our fellowship uh, around race and politics. And the truth is, we needed a practical solution. What is a place where we can all agree? We might not agree about the approach, but we can agree that people are hurting. And so it's really amazing to me that Christians with very different ideological viewpoints get incredibly passionate about serving the poor together. Also, people that are not Christians get incredibly passionate about serving the poor. And there's a growing number of uh, millennials and, and, and people that are uh, really turned off by religion that actually see Christianity best um, when it's practiced and not just preached. And so we knew that, that all those things were realities. So we're like, all right, so let's figure out how we can understand that and engage in a practical way. And that's a big part of what kind of drove us into the community. But then every community has to make sense of what that looks like. And so you don't want to give a baker bread. So we had to learn our community study our community uh, and, and be able to figure out how we could contribute in a, in a real meaningful way and not just an episodic way, which is honestly what we were doing before. Um, and we're still figuring it out. So it's not like, look at what we're doing now. It's still just, you know, it's a, we're trying, we're seeing what works and there's some things that are working and some things not so much. So that's, that's a big part of what kind of informed our, our conviction around this issue. Amen. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Will. I appreciate that. Uh, Danny. Okay, let me unmute. Yeah, it's actually Marie. Hey, Marie. Hey, yeah, Danny uh, got a teaching job, so he's preparing for that. So nice. he's substituting. So he's a little over his head right now. Not well, um, <laughs> good, good problem to yeah. have. 
Good so problem. I'm here. Um, but yeah, so, well, my question was, so I served with um, Union. I'm trying to see if I can see you, but I just don't want to look at myself. We, we can see um, you. <laughs> oh, you can see me. I want to see what, okay. Um, so I served with Union Gospel Mission um, for four years. Yeah. And I, I started doing that because I collected socks at church for a sock drive. And they're okay. like, well, come see where these socks are going. I was like, okay. Yeah. And so we gave them out. And um, my friend had started a non for profit And she was kind of the middle person meeting needs that Union Gospel Mission couldn't. And I was kind of saying, I, I mean, I, I really loved it. It was super fulfilling for me. I couldn't wait to do it. Um, and we'd go serve at night. We, I, I went on different vans. And we brought food and water. And the big thing with them is building, we're being constants in that community, like being consistent. Um, so I just think some practicals, I just, would you throw out there? I mean, would you think there's like powers and power and numbers? Cause I always kept trying to get people to go with me, but it didn't fit everybody's comfortability level. Cause it was like serving the homeless. It was at night, um, it was in the streets of Seattle. So not everybody felt comfortable um, putting themselves in that position. Um, and I want to honor and respect that too. So, um, I don't know, but I know there's power in numbers cause I kind of felt like I was just out myself out there doing it. And so, um, yeah, and we're, I'm constantly looking for ways to serve in the community. Um, me and Danny just went and helped, uh, this business that's starting, they're building a yurt. Um, we helped build a yurt. Um, it was a new business that's starting up. So it was cool. Cause we met like five other people that were in our community um so i don't know what would you say like some practicals um yes. i think you're, you're get, asking get some traction you know sure i think you're asking a great question and, and what i would say about that is there are definitely some activities that you do that can mobilize many christians i i think christians have because of the the presence of the holy spirit a strong desire to serve the community but sometimes there are not it, it's it, it doesn't fit a, a life schedule or, or what's going on. Um, it might not fit even the congregational plan that, that's going on as well. Um, so I think there are times where a few people can serve. I also try not to limit my service to just Christians. Uh, you know, I, I want to find ways to engage with my friends that are not yet Christians and bring them with me to serve and serve together. Uh, so I think that might help you even with some of the traction in terms of time. I don't know all the specifics well enough to say all of what that would look like, but there's some people that are very passionate about specific areas of service that I can think of right now that just a few people do it and it has such a big impact. Um, you know, um, you know, in, in our rural communities um, here in Virginia, we have major issues with food insecurity and there are a, a handful of Christians that they're really passionate about that area of service. I try to encourage that and encourage them to do that and encourage them to mobilize people mm -hmm. to do those things. But, but then there are other activities where we can all come together, um, you know, and I think that's, that's just a conversation for you guys to work out. But I, I understand what you're talking about and I'm really grateful that you're doing that work. Um, that, that's really amazing. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Marie. Uh, Daryl. Okay. Hi guys. So it was actually Ruby. No, 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 uh, no surprise with, with a question, but um, thank you for your lesson. I really appreciate, especially your ending because the last couple months I have felt um, really discouraged, um, dismayed about uh, just the, some of the conversations we've had as congregation, you know, some of the people, brothers and sisters and um, with um, having difference of opinions, different political views. Yeah. And, and I'm, I've just on, honestly gotten kind of scared um, yeah. inside in my heart. And so I so appreciate you saying, man, God's got all of this and how to really uh, have a confidence about um, God's got it. <laughs> and, and um and and not have that retreating feeling um mm -hmm. so i so 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 appreciate it i my question was how in the last couple months 
there are there are people who feel like the church is not a place for particularly to to talk about politics or mm -hmm. to um you know right. have discuss race or discuss those kind of things and i just wondered especially with uh varying people in your church how did you start that how, what scriptures did you bring to kind of see for people to kind of um you know partner in that so yeah that's a great question and i i share your sentiment um oh i'm sorry were you, were you gonna say something else oh no 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 no, no. i'm sorry no okay. i wanted to see yeah. you <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I share your sentiment there. I completely understand what you're saying. Um, I have felt the same hurt, um, uh, you know, just, and, I, and you know, and, and I, as, as, as I talked to Dana actually about this and I was like, Dana, are you sure you want me to talk, man? <laughs> you know, cause I'm just letting you know, you know, I, I, I'm working through it too. You know, I think it's, it's important to own the reality um, of where we are with things. I, I think, you know, we are a diverse family and uh, people have different perspectives and different upbringings. Um, some folks don't want to talk about controversial issues in our family. Uh, and some folks feel like if you don't talk about it, then you don't care about our family. You know, so th those are and both sets of views have to be respected. Um, but I think it's but but the, the reality is, in most cases, not talking about it has been our posture, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's been our default posture. And also we presented it as if we had it together. And, and that's my opinion. I just think we're really messed up like all the people in the Bible. And God doesn't seem to spare any punches with telling you how messed up people are. And I think once you embrace that you're messed up, it really is liberating. It's like, okay, you know, because it was jacked up in Act 6. Like, that was bad. Like, these are widows. What in the world? You don't want to give a widow food because of their race or their ethnicity? Define it. Use whatever word you want. It's because of where they come from and how they sound that you don't want to give them food. That's really messed up. But the apostles didn't brush it on away. They didn't put it away. Like, Luke wrote it down so everyone would remember. Um, you know, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But when you deal with difficult issues, it shows the power of God because the world is already broken, but to resolve brokenness is what shows the power of God. To say that brokenness is not present and sin is not present is just not honest. Um, so I say all that to say this. I, I think how we've tried to deal with it is to be honest, to be respectful, and to recognize that we have difference. Um, and to honor that difference. Um, we just recently um, um, appointed a group of deacons and deaconesses specifically to tackle these issues. And, and we're not starting with them bringing in solutions. We're actually starting with them listening to each other and learning each other's stories and being able to connect on how they're gonna get restored with each other and then bring that restoration into the, into the family. Um, you know, and then to help us to, to really be restored in our relationship. So I think real conversations are critical and super helpful. Um, but, but I think owning it and being honest is perhaps the most challenging thing. Um, here's the deal. Nothing, no weapon formed against us will prosper. So nothing will harm us. But dealing with living in this world will hurt. <laughs> it's kind of like the, if you have a rotten tooth, if you don't deal with the rotten tooth, it's going to harm you. But if you take it out, it's going to hurt. So there are things we have to take out, you know, uh, of our community that will hurt to do it. But it won't harm us to do it. It will actually bring healing and wholeness. Um, and, and racism is rotten and needs to be extracted. You know, prejudice is rotten and needs to be extracted. Um, you know, selfishness, greed is rotten and needs to be extracted. Like, we got lots of sin. Um, but if we see it as such and deal with it accordingly, then I think we can be, we will be okay. Um, you know, but, but I'm not saying it won't hurt, you know, but, um, but that, that's, that's what I think. I, I hope that helps. Yeah. That was very helpful. Helpful. I, I, one of the things you said, Will, that, uh, that I really appreciated was the idea of extending ourselves 
Uh, mm -hmm. You know, all of us, imagine that, you know, all of us extending ourselves to one another, you know, to the right and to the left of one another. And, and imagine all of us doing that. I think that's when we can have these conversations. And that really has been one of the, you know, goals of, of all of these uh, meetings of, of, of our series has been to uh, teach us how to learn to talk about these difficult and very nuanced issues. The reality is that, man, these, these things, right, talking about race and politics and culture and COVID-19 and all of our preferences, these are all really nuanced issues and yeah. they're very challenging uh, things to talk about. But I think not talking about them has not served us well thus far, right. not as a community. I, I, I think a lot of times we can be disillusioned by thinking that because we're not talking or we're not arguing or we're not fighting that we have peace or that we have unity. But the truth is that that may not be the same as unity. Uh, we, there may be peace, but it may not be intimacy. And I think what we really long for as disciples, as Christians, is intimacy. And the only way that I know to really get to intimacy, even in my marriage, is that sometimes we have to deal with the conflict between us. And that's the way it is in the church as well. And so I think that we've got to, if we can just embrace, you know, we can reach out and realize that we don't all agree with each other politically and ideology, you know, with, with we have different ideologies. And, you know, there are things about one another that we just flat out don't understand. Like, I don't understand why white people don't use washcloths. You know, I, I, I maybe that's just me, but you know, that's just, there are little things that we don't understand. Now, I don't know if anybody understands what I just said there, but that's, you know, it's just one of those little weird, strange nuances, right? That, uh, anyway, ask me about that later. I said, I'm, I'm, that la later. I'm laughing about you saying that because <laughs> me, me and Tasha have this argument because um, I grew up in boarding school and I don't use a washcloth. And she's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know what's wrong with you you know and, and it's and so i i i get the I, i'm with you bro you understand that right yeah, yeah. okay yeah, very it. good get so it. you know all that to say guys you know i really do hope that these these uh this series is has been a catalyst for us to begin to feel safe to begin or at least to continue uh these conversations so uh dave i'm gonna let you close this out with the final uh thought or question uh, actually, no, I have got, uh, I've got the Garvitas. <laughs> I've got the Garvitas in there. So I can ask my question real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yep. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, aside from it, this has been inspiring, the whole series, especially tonight, it's been a hopeful. I feel a lot of hope just from listening to you, Will, and your message today. I just have a quick question. Um, with your involvement in the community through the years, but then with COVID happening, what are you guys doing differently to adapt? I mean, how are you still getting out there or, you know? Yeah, it, it's changed everything, you know, cause we, we're, we, our strength is like volunteer mobilization and we we're not able to volunteer the same way. Um, we've had to find different ways to do it. Um, you know, smaller groups of people, um, you know, there's a, like a, a mobile app that we've invested in, in being a part of in the community called um, the Food Rescue app. So, you know, people go on food rescues and get food to people. Um, and, um, but we've had to adapt. Um, you know, I, we've definitely had to adapt I mean, because you can't gather in large groups. And, you know, like our big thing was that great banquet. We couldn't do it. Uh, but we ended up doing something to encourage the church which is a drive through barbecue, you know? And so we had to kind of ch change things up a little bit. Um, but I, I think um, I think it's the, the sad reality is that the, the coronavirus has only served to create more need and so therefore more opportunity for us to serve. So I think it's just figuring out creative ways, um, you know, to kind of serve in our community. Um, but it's, um, We've also leaned in more to community partnerships um, and collaboration because that way we can we can identify needs a little bit better. 
um, and be a little bit more targeted. That's a part, a part of what led us to this CARES Act funding that we're able to do. Um, but again, we're not doing nearly as much as I think we have the capacity to do, um, but we've had to adapt. So that's a great question. Okay, thank you. Amen. Thanks, Naomi. All right, Dave or Katie. Hi, hi, Will. It's Katie. Dave's here also. Hey. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I loved what you shared about embedding yourself into the community. How did you help? And then about the as disciples, we kind of have been culturally trained to bring, you know, circle the wagons and bring people into our community rather where really, you know, to go out. How did you help? My question is, how did you help the disciples to really just have that change of thinking, that mindset change to where um, the most effective way, and we see Jesus in the gospels is that he went out. Um, so I was just curious how you were able to help the disciples in that, that paradigm shift. Yeah, absolutely. Very slowly and intentionally is how we were able to make this shift and we're still making it, you know? Um, you know, some of the things that we did is, you know, we had a conversation. I'm not saying this is what you should do, just what we did is we invited community leaders. Like I said, we had a, a Democrat and a Republican congressman come in and just share with us about how to be a good neighbor. Nothing political, just talking about community engagement. So, so having, letting, inviting the community in was one of the ways. I think the, the other thing that we have done and we're still doing is, um, you know, modeling what it looks like to, to go in. You know, we, we have, for a large part, taken on what I call a FUBU mentality, for us, by us. So we only do the stuff that we do, and we do it our way, and we put our spin on it. And so we've decided it, we wouldn't, not that I don't think FUBU clothing is cool, for anybody that knows about FUBU clothing, um, you know, um, but, but we decided our, we're going to actually go in and, and partner with the key leaders in our community. So we have a partner here called ACTS, uh, Action Community Through Service. They do some things we can't do well, so we just volunteer with them. And, um, and, you know, and, and we don't get, you know, recognition for that. We just do that because it's right. But it also opens up doors for them to know that we're a church that they can rely on and depend on. Um, I, I think you have to tailor whatever that is for the, your, your specific community or specific region. Um, but the, the principle is if you model what it looks like to do that, that's probably the best way for there to be change. You don't need a lot of people to model it, just a few people that say, hey, we're gonna go into the community as opposed to only ask the community to come into us. And I think what we would find and what we're finding now is Matthew 9, 38 is real. We need to pray for workers because the harvest really is plentiful. And, and that's, um, there, there's more need than ever and more people that are open to the gospel, but most people need to see it, not just hear it. They've heard a lot about Christianity. Most people need to see Christianity. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, um, Will, thank you again and again. Um, we are, let me see. So we have, it's 820 right now. Uh, I think what we're going to do tonight is uh, we're just going to keep the, the line open. Feel free to jump off whenever you're ready. I'm going to actually see if I could get uh, our brother, um, Walter Chanel to close us with a prayer. But if you'd like to stay on and just hang out for fellowship for a minute, feel free to hang out. If you wanna jump off after the prayer, feel free to jump off uh, and we'll close it out that, with that tonight. I do wanna remind you next week, uh, we are gonna meet up at seven o'clock uh, back here at this Zoom location and we are going to have our, our prayer meeting. And uh, it's gonna be a great time together. Landon's gonna be leading that time for us uh, next week, but I just want to encourage you guys, please make sure you come back ready to pray. We will jump into small groups and pray together in smaller groups uh, as we go on. So uh, this has been fantastic. This series is coming to a conclusion, but hopefully we are stronger and better prepared to deal with all of the things that are ahead of us. So uh, Will, again, man, amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, Walter, if you could go on and lead us in a prayer. Amen. Yeah, thank you again, Will. And thank you again, Dana. So appreciate it. I mean, all the work. Um, this, the weeks in advance, you were uh, 
you were talking just about having this series. So um, uh, I really feel like uh, uh, we're prepared um, for the uncertain yet again, but faithfully and spiritually, um, thank you so much, brother, for the leadership in that too. Brothers, let's go to God in prayer. Uh, Father God Almighty, um, it is ex an exciting time to be disciples, Father. Uh, this 2020, as we in many venues have spoken about, Father, is unlike anything we might have planned or expected. But we thank you, Lord, as we turn the pages of your word, God Almighty, to look at those that have come before us, Father, Old Testament and New, God Almighty. Uh, they themselves did not know what lied ahead, Father God. We saw even in the disciples not truly understanding the master's plan as they walk with him each and every day, Father God Almighty. And Father God, so much so in our lives. But we do know this, Father God, your word is true. Father, you are faithful by nature. And Father God, we are your people. And so Father, we thank you so much, God, for all the brothers and sisters that have taken their time, Father God, particularly those that are in time differences, Father God, further along than us, uh, God, to see their passion, their love, their conviction, their vulnerability, their honesty about walking a faithful journey. And that's what we want, Father God. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray your spirit can unite us, Father, here in the South Sound Church. Thank you so much for the leadership. Thank you so much for the questions and the engagement. Help mm -hmm. us, God, to see how our lives fit into your story, Lord Almighty God. Help mm -hmm. us, God Almighty, to see how much we've been given to. And God Almighty, though we may feel like needs are many just in our own lives, God, we have so much to give. And I Pray we may be stirred by your spirit, Father God, to connect to those around us. And I'm inspired by my brothers and sisters, Father God, that are still reaching out, studying mm -hmm. the Bible, serving and seeing the needs around us. Father God, to make the most of this short time we have under the sun, God. Motivate and inspire our hearts. No matter what happens after November 3rd, God, you are still God and we right. are still your people. So, Father, use us, Father God, mold us and shape us that we may take a place in history, inspire many lives around us, and God, see souls saved in your name. Father, we love you. We thank you. Bless this church, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.